Hey everybody, welcome to today's intro to Kubernetes and Rancher class. My name is Adrian Goins. I'm the Director of Community and Evangelism here at Rancher Labs. There's lots of ways that you can contact me. You'll get a copy of the slides after the training, and uh, if you want to reach out to me, you can do so. If you tweet about this while you're in the training, uh, please use the hashtags Rancher Training and Rancher Kates so that the people who do our social networking stuff can follow those things and retweet them and do all of that crazy social networking nonsense. Like I said, we have a lot of stuff to go through today. There's some basic introduction and housekeeping stuff, and then we're going to go into installing K3S. Now I'm going to run you through pretty much everything you need to know about how to use Kubernetes and customize, and then we'll dive into installing Rancher and using it. And although we say that we do final Q&A at the end, it's only me here. So if you look at your GoToWebinar panel, you'll see that there's a questions tab. Please open that up. And uh, yeah, as you think of questions, post them there. And I'll stop periodically throughout the class and answer questions. The only thing I ask is that you keep the questions on topic to what you're learning today. So if you have like a specific rancher or troubleshooting question or something like that, that uh, is a little too specific, I might deflect you over to one of our other support channels. The questions panel, since I always have it open, is also where you can post things like, hey, the audio's dead, or hey, I don't know, whatever. Uh, so if there's any issues with the show, if I'm too loud, too soft, too not streaming, then just let me know. You don't need to have any Kubernetes knowledge for today. It's helpful if you have some basic container knowledge, but even if you don't, that's fine. If you thought you were coming to like a cooking class or something, hang out anyway, because uh, you're gonna learn some cool stuff. There is a repository for today's class. And in fact, I'll just pop that up in, oh, there's supposed to be a news crawler, but that didn't work. Let's see, let's do resources, there we go. So if you didn't copy this down, that's okay. Uh, It'll be scrolling across the bottom of the screen. Everything I'm doing today is scripted, so you can pull the readme out of that and follow along. We also have tremendous documentation. So after this class, head over to rancher.com slash docs, and there you'll find, well, everything you need to know about Rancher, K3S, RKE, and so on. I mentioned a moment ago alternative support channels. We have the Rancher users Slack, which is at slack.rancher.io. And then we also have the forums. Well, hang on, let me jump back to the Slack thing. If you don't have an invitation, you can go to slack.rancher.io and you can get one. If you do have an invitation and you already have an account, it's actually rancher-users.slack.com. But if you go to the URL that's listed there, there's actually a thing that says go to the other place. So you only have to remember one thing. And for me, slack.rancher.io is easier to remember. We also have forums. And the difference between Slack and the forums is uh, on Slack, we've got something like 20,000 people registered and there's several thousand people logged in and there's all kinds of specific channels and rancher engineers hang out there as well. So it's good for quick questions and hey, uh, you know, I need some immediate help. For longer term stuff, conceptual stuff, or for browsing things that other people might've posted in the past, the forums are a better place to go. Mix and match, use whichever works for you. We do get people in this class who don't know anything about Rancher. So if you'll give me just a couple of minutes, I'll tell you a little bit about where we fit in the Kubernetes world and why I think that's important. We have, well, first of all, Rancher builds open source software for compute everywhere, for deploying and managing Kubernetes clusters anywhere in the world. And in our experience, having deployed this in thousands upon thousands of environments, we've recognized that there are two key pillars for a successful Kubernetes strategy. One is that you run a certified Kubernetes distribution, and the other is that you have a centralized management layer that gives you support for shared tools and services, security policy and user management, and consistent cluster operations. And once you have those two foundation layers, then whatever you put on top is going to be successful. We made software that does all of these things. So for the, the Kubernetes distribution layer, we have two Kubernetes distributions. One is RKE and the other is K3S. RKE is full 100% upstream Kubernetes packaged inside of Docker containers. This makes it portable and much easier to deploy than other Kubernetes distributions. K3S is still upstream Kubernetes, but it has the bare minimum of what you need for a bare metal or basic cloud provider Kubernetes deployment. And it's designed for IoT devices and the edge, or really any resource constrained environment. It runs all of the Kubernetes components inside of 512 megabytes of RAM. And that makes it great for you know, ARM devices, single board computers, edge devices, anything that operates in a resource constrained environment. 
On top of that, you have Rancher. And Rancher is the industry's most widely adopted Kubernetes management platform. It's 100% open source, and it has more than 100 million downloads right now. It enables production quality Kubernetes everywhere by delivering on those key requirements that I stated a moment ago. So for consistent cluster operations, it gives simple, consistent cluster operations, including provisioning, version management, visibility and diagnostics, monitoring and alerting, and centralized audit. It enables you to automate processes and apply a consistent set of user access and security policies for all of your clusters, no matter where they're running. And it provides a rich ecosystem catalog of services for building, deploying, and scaling containerized applications, including app packaging, CICD, logging, monitoring, and service mesh. And on top of that, I, I've listed Rio here, which is our engine for deploying Kubernetes applications, but that's still super alpha. You can put anything you want up at that top layer as long as it's built on these principles. And honestly, you don't even have to use our software. You can use any Kubernetes distribution that's certified by the CNCF, and Rancher supports the deployment and management of Kubernetes in all sorts of places, as you'll see later on in today's class. I already gave you information about K3S from this slide because I got ahead of myself. K3S is production quality. It's designed for, I mean, you can still run it in the data center. RKE is designed for the data center. It, K3S, it's just fantastic. It's, it's so easy to spin up. It's so easy to start doing stuff with. And the, our instructions for installing it have you SSHing into the nodes and then doing the install yourself. But Alex Ellis, who's the guy behind OpenFast and Inlets and some other really cool open source projects, came up with Ketchup which is how we're going to do the installation today. There we go. So Ketchup install, we're going to pass it the IP of the host that I'm going to SSH into. And I'll be SSHing in as the root user because we're just here in my home environment. Ketchup. Each version of Ketchup that comes out, each release is tied to a specific release version of K3S, but they don't move at the same pace. So if there's a newer version of K3S that you want to install, you can pass that to Ketchup as I did here. This is now going to SSH into the node and build us a single node Kubernetes cluster. This takes less than a minute, uh, even including the time that it takes to download the K3S binary, which I already have installed over there. And when it's done, it brings back a Kubernetes configuration file and also saves this locally. This is how you will connect to the cluster that you deploy using a tool called kubectl. Easiest thing to do is set this file's location as the value of the kubeconfig environment variable. And this syntax is for fish. If you use bash, it's a little bit different. You'll actually export kubeconfig equals. And once that's done, we can run kubectl get nodes and see that our cluster is up and ready. So with that, let's jump into Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a daunting platform when you don't know what you're looking at. But after you've been in it for a while, you'll recognize that it's just about taking small components and assembling them into applications. If you came into this class with no Kubernetes experience whatsoever, you're going to leave this class in, what do we got left, an hour and 20 minutes with everything you need to know to build and deploy basic applications on Kubernetes. And I'm not going to teach you everything about Kubernetes. There's other things here like persistent storage and service mesh and stuff like that. But all of it starts with these things. Pods, replica sets, deployments, config maps, services, and ingresses. The pod is the smallest unit that can be deployed inside of a Kubernetes cluster. All a pod is is a logical representation of one or more containers, and when there's more than one container, they share network space, storage space, and some other things that aren't relevant for this class. If you've ever deployed 
if you've ever deployed an application that needed or a container that needed to talk to another container, like uh, you know something that needed to talk to MySQL, it's fine when you've just got two containers. But once you have multiple containers and containers on different hosts, it rapidly becomes a, a big nasty ball of spaghetti. Pods solve this problem by making sure that containers in a pod are scheduled together and that they can talk to one another on localhost. So imagine a fast CGI type application where you have a web server that needs to talk to a backend server for PHP or Python or Ruby or whatever that's doing some heavy lifting. Those things in a normal infrastructure environment tend to talk to each other on localhost. And with pods, that's still possible. Whereas with standard containers, it's not. Here's an image taken from the Kubernetes documentation that shows this in action. You have a file puller on the left that pulls content in from some external CMS and saves it to a local disk. Then you have a web server that responds to requests from consumers by pulling that content off the disk and delivering it. This is a good representation of a two container pod where the pod is a unit of function. It does a thing. And when your application needs more horsepower, you're going to scale up the number of pods. So it doesn't make sense to have containers in a pod that aren't closely related to one another, like a web server and a database server, because if you need more of one, you don't need more of the other. And in that particular example, the database server would just be a horrible nightmare to deal with anyway. And just make sure that as you're designing your pods, that your containers are closely related and together they, they provide some service. Much of the time you will have pods with just a single container, and that's totally fine. Everything in Kubernetes happens with what are called manifests, and manifests are written in YAML. Don't be alarmed. As we get further into this, you'll see that there are lots of ways to generate this YAML. You don't have to, you're not gonna be sitting down and writing all of this stuff from scratch, but it's important to understand what it is so that you know what you're dealing with. The pod specification has four top level keys. In fact, everything has four top level keys, but the API version, kind, metadata, and spec. API version tells Kubernetes where in its API definition it can find information about how to create whatever the thing is that you're telling it to create. In this case, that thing is a pod. Metadata we talk about in a little bit, so we'll jump to spec. Spec defines the thing that you're creating. In the pod spec, there's a key for containers, and underneath that is a list of one or more containers. Those have to have, at the very least, a name and an image. And there's lots of other optional stuff that you can override. In this case, we are overriding the command for the BusyBox container by telling it to echo hello Kubernetes and then sleep for a second, after which it will exit. We'll go and run this now, and I want you to think to yourself what's going to happen when it exits. We apply manifests to the cluster with kubectl apply and then dash f and point it at the file that we want to apply. If I were to show you that file, you'll see that it's just exactly what we were looking at a moment ago. Kubernetes responds by saying, hey, super, I did what you asked. And we can now run kubectl get pods and you'll see that it's in the container creating state. Now we could just continue to press up arrow all day long to continue to run this, or we can provide dash W and kubectl will update us whenever the state or status field or any other field changes. In this case, you see that we have a new status of crash loop back off. Previously it was container creating and then it was completed and now it's in this state. And if we wait for a moment, you'll see that it's running, now it's completed and it'll go back into a crash loop back off state. When you tell Kubernetes to do something, unless you tell it that the thing it's starting is going to run and then exit, Kubernetes expects that that thing is going to continue running. And in our case, it's printing out the information and then exiting. And Kubernetes doesn't know that that's normal behavior, so it restarts it and it exits and it restarts it and it exits and it restarts it and it exits and Kubernetes says, okay, hang on a second. Clearly this isn't working. So I'm just gonna like, hang out for a second and maybe two seconds, and then I'm gonna try and start you again. And then it exits again. And it's like, okay, you know what? I'm gonna wait four seconds and starts it and it exits again. And I'm gonna wait eight seconds. And it continues to increase this timer all the way up to 10 minutes between restarts before starting over again at zero. It does this so that a runaway pod or a pod with an error doesn't 
consume all of the resources of the cluster trying to start and run when clearly it's broken. Maybe it's waiting for a database to come up. Maybe it's waiting for you know, something else, a cache to be primed. Kubernetes doesn't know. And if it continues to crash, Kubernetes just hopes that eventually a human being will come along and fix it. In the meantime, it's going to preserve the well-being of the cluster. Let's delete that with kubectl delete pod myapp dash pod. And it's all gone. What we just did, it's fine. And, and you're going to be doing a lot of that. You're going to be starting things and stopping them and using the kubectl command line. But from the very beginning, I want you to think about how to make sure that the things you do are declarative and repeatable. And the reason for this is because if you can't be replaced, you can't be promoted. So if I'm sitting here in my house in South America and I make some manual change to the cluster, and then I close my laptop and I go on vacation. If something happens to the cluster while I'm away, my colleagues don't know what I've done, they don't know what the current state is, and they have to come and find me to get me to go and fix it. And maybe I'm out fishing or you know, I'm doing, who knows, I'm doing something other than dealing with my Kubernetes cluster. I have a responsibility to make sure that other people can keep track of the state of the thing. These sorts of concepts already exist in configuration management with tools like Terraform and Ansible and Puppet and Chef and so on and so forth. But there was never really a good way to do it with Kubernetes until some people came along with a tool called Customize. Customize allows you to template your manifests and then commit them to a source code repository, which brings us more into a GitOps style model of doing things where, oh, I didn't switch back to my slides. Huh, look at that, okay. So there's all my declarative and repeatable action stuff, the slide that goes along with that, and now we're over to the customized slide. So customize was built into kubectl in 1.14, and it allows you to move into a GitOps model where the repository is the source of truth. So now if I make a change, I don't make it directly to the cluster. I test it locally, and then I commit that to a Git repo, and then something else is responsible for pulling that content out of the repository and applying it to the cluster. The entire cluster could melt down, and it could be rebuilt from the Git repo. I'll show you lots of different ways to do things in today's class, some of which we'll do manually, some of which I'll show you with customized templates, less so that you, like, don't think you have to learn customize today, but more so that you understand the capability of what's out there so that as you're moving forward in your Kubernetes adventure, you can decide which tools are best for you. You'll never create pods directly because a pod by itself doesn't give you any really good way to manage it. It's just, it's a thing, it's an object, it exists in a vacuum. Replica sets are a layer of abstraction above pods and they introduce state management and they control the desired scale, which is the number of pods and the state of those pods. Are they stopped or are they started? Here we have three hosts and we have 12 replicas of a pod. One of those hosts could die and Kubernetes says, okay, the desired state is 12. The actual state is eight. And the only thing that Kubernetes exists to do is to reconcile the desired state with the actual state. So it spins up four more pods on the remaining two hosts. This is state management in the Kubernetes sense. In a moment, we'll talk about stateful and stateless applications, which is totally different. But just understand that Kubernetes exists entirely to reconcile the desired state with the actual state. And when you apply a manifest to a cluster, you are changing the desired state. You don't tell Kubernetes, hey, go start this pod on that host and this pod on that host. You leave Kubernetes to figure out according to the parameters that you've defined, schedulers and other things, how to do what you need it to do. And it can go so far as saying, okay, these, this host over here is using more than 75% of its available RAM, so I'm not gonna put any more pods on it. I'm gonna put the pods over here. It is a system designed to do the best possible thing for what you've asked it to do. But you're never gonna create a replica set either. We used to create them directly. There was a thing called a replication controller and it, it, it was replaced by a deployment controller. 
A deployment controller, well, you, it creates deployments. Deployments create replica sets. Replica sets create pods. So deployments are where we're going to spend uh, the next few minutes. Uh, I spent a lot of time in deployments because this is where you're going to spend most of your time. The deployment controller gives us a much better interface for controlling and communicating with the, the pods. It just kind of jumps over. Like think that deployments create pods. The replica set is an intermediate layer that exists, but you really, you never talk to it. You don't, you don't care about it. But this introduces controllers. Today we only talk about deployment controllers and later on ingress controllers, but a controller is a thing inside of Kubernetes that creates things. So a deployment controller creates deployments. An ingress controller, it doesn't really create ingresses, but it, it responds to those requests. You'll see that later in the class. Deployments are for stateless applications. HTTP is a stateless application. You can recognize a stateless application because it doesn't matter which pod your traffic lands on. It doesn't matter if your traffic lands on pod A and then the next time on pod B. It doesn't matter if you delete pod A and start pod C. If it doesn't matter, then you have a stateless application. If it does matter, well, that's a different story. It does matter, for example, if you have a, a primary database and two replicas. In that case, well, it matters who the primary is. It matters what address it has, what storage it has, that it comes up first, that its name and address are persistent, that the replicas can find it. And this is replicas in the sense of replication, not in the sense of pod replicas. Sorry that we all have to use the same words now. So when you have an application where things like that matter, that's a stateful application. And you can still run those inside of Kubernetes using what's called a stateful set. There are also daemon sets where one pod replica is launched on every node. So if you have three nodes, and you launch a daemon set, you get three pods. And if you add a fourth node, it automatically gets a pod. There are also jobs and cron jobs. A job is like what we launched at the beginning, where it just spins up and it does something and then it exits and Kubernetes doesn't restart it. But if you want to schedule jobs, then you attach them to a cron job and it works exactly like it does in Linux, where you know cron is cron. So here, an example of what we can do with a deployment is let's say that we have our application running version 1.0 and version 1.1 comes out. Well, we can tell the deployment, hey, upgrade yourself to 1.1. And it'll start some new pods with the new container image, and then it will do what's called a rolling update across the cluster, where you can configure how exactly it does it, but by default, it'll start one and then stop one and then start another one and stop another one. In this case, we're doing it two by two. So it launched two new ones, killed off two of the old ones, launched two new ones, killed off two of the old ones, and now we're running on version 1.1 of the application. This also includes the ability to roll back. It includes the ability to, to control the speed at which things roll out, the minimum number of pods that need to be available at any time, and, and gives a much better interaction with the cluster for, for handling things at the application layer. This wasn't present with replication controllers, and this is why everything's now built into deployments. So back over here. I can show you the manifest for a deployment. It looks kind of like that. I'm not sure why my news keeps coming up there. Let me make that go away. Deployment manifest looks like this. You still have API version kind metadata and spec, but now in the spec, notice that everything from template down looks exactly like the spec we had for a pod, where you had metadata and then you have spec and you have containers and you have you know, some stuff going on about your container. That's because ultimately the end result of a deployment is actually a pod. Above that, you still have API version. In this case, it's in a slightly different location. Deployment is the thing, metadata and spec. Let's talk about metadata. Metadata is, well, it's metadata. It's key value pairs that, that give additional information about the thing. Every single thing has to have, at the very least, a name. It's good to also set some labels. Labels are key value pairs that are completely arbitrary. You can make these whatever you want, but it's a good practice to set labels that allow you to uniquely identify a thing. And the reason for this is because Kubernetes uses labels in what are called selectors. I told you that a replica set manages a group of pods and a deployment manages a replica set. Well, when the replica set 
is looking for its pods, it doesn't know them by name, it doesn't know them by IP address, it only knows them by their labels. It's going to look for all pods that have a label of app equals nginx. And down here in our pod spec, you see that we are setting a label of app equals nginx. And the deployment also sets a label of app equals nginx, not because anything needs to select it, but just because it allows us to select all things in the cluster with the label of app equals nginx and know that they're all related. You can add more labels. You'll see that we do that a little bit later on with environments and things like that. And then you can make really nice complicated selectors that can be as granular or vague as you want them to be. But let's create this deployment differently. I can do this. I can simply say kubectl create deployment nginx and tell it that the image is nginx 1.16 alpine. And Kubernetes will be happy to do what I asked it to do. I can also tell it dry run equals client and to output the information as YAML. What this will do is it will generate the YAML that it would have applied to the cluster, but it will show it to me instead. So I could write this out to a file and then I could open the file and I could edit it and then I could save that, commit it to a repo. And so, so this is one of the ways that you can generate the YAML that you need. You, honestly, nobody sits down and writes these things from scratch. You either copy and paste it from somewhere or you create it like this or you have something else created for you. Our deployment is running. Great. You can see that it's got one available and one up to date. We can see the replica set that it created, which notice it has the name of the deployment dash eight characters. And then we can say, show us the pods and the pods have the name of the deployment followed by the replica set followed by the pods. So this is another way that you can see what is related. We can scale this up. by telling it we want three replicas. And now we have three replicas. That was pretty easy. So let's upgrade that. One of the ways that we can do that is by saying kubectl set image, specify the name of the deployment, and then pass it the container name and the new image name. Even though there's only one container inside, we still have to tell it which container we want to update. So this will update us to nginx 1.17 Alpine. And we can watch this happen with kubectl rollout status. And if we sit here, this will tell us, you know, as things get updated and as things get terminated, and then it'll just go back to the prompt when it's done. The idea behind this is that when you manually do an update, you should watch it. And if it's taking longer than it should, like this one is, well then you should go and do some investigation. Investigation always happens, always starts with kubectl get pods. You look at the final thing and here we can see, oh, well, shoot, there's an error, error image poll. But notice that while our new pod isn't running, our three old pods are running. So our application is still up, users are still on it, people are still buying stuff, our boss isn't angry, we're not gonna get fired. We have the time to figure out what's going on here. We've been using kubectl get, and kubectl get shows you resources. And we could even have it show us the YAML for the specific thing. But in this case, we want to see how Kubernetes sees the object. For that, we use kubectl describe. So kubectl describe that pod, and it's going to send us a bunch of information. So I'm going to pipe that to less. And now we have a view of the object as Kubernetes understands it. So this is not the configuration of the object. This is, well, it's like, uh, whatever, it's how Kubernetes sees it. There's lots of stuff here, but I'm going to jump down to the events section at the bottom. The events section tells us everything that's happened to the particular object since it was born. 
So you can see here it was assigned to somewhere, the image was pulled, we've got an error, and here we have the actual error message. And that tells me, oh, it can't find the image because I spelled it wrong. Well, yeah, that's never gonna work. So let's fix that. kubectl rollout undo will either roll back something that's completed to its previous state, or if it never made it anywhere at all, then it just undoes it. And so we're back to our original three pods. And let's, let's look at a different way that we can do this. We can use kubectl edit. This will reach out to the cluster and it'll bring back the actual YAML that's running. And then it'll let us edit it. So let's, for example, change this to 17. And when we save and exit, that'll be applied to the cluster. Uh, and now if we watch our status, if I can get this typed in fast enough, you'll see that it will actually do its rollout and its termination, and then it'll tell us when everything is done successfully rolled out, and the old ones are already gone. The new ones have only been up for a few seconds, and so there we go. This, well, this is important, but this is not declarative and it's not repeatable. So let's look at how we can do this using Customize. We now have no pods running. Well, they're being terminated, so it's effectively the same thing. And you already saw this, which is in the repository. There are several other files in here. We just looked at the deployment file, but there's a customization file this is what Customize will look for when you tell it to deploy something. And it's pretty easy to understand. You've got resources, it says, okay, go do whatever is in these two files, deployment.yaml and service.yaml. And then there's a config map generator which says, go into, you know, go take this file and go make a config map called index out of it. We'll talk about config maps in a little bit. When you're applying something off of a customization file, you use kubectl apply dash k and you point it at the directory where the customization.yaml exists. This will now create the config map, create the service and create the deployment. And it does some really cool stuff where, for example, if I jump down to the bottom here, you'll see that the deployment wants to use a config map that has the name index. Well, what it created It doesn't have the name index, it has the name index dash some unique identifier. But if we look at the deployment, when Customize applied it, you can see here that it actually changed, like it recognized that, that index has a unique identifier and so it adjusted the deployment as it applied it to reference the current config map. We could go in and we could change that config map and change some value inside of it, and it would update the config map, update the deployment, redeploy everything, and well, now you start to get into templating. But if I stopped here, you probably think, well, what does this get me over what I'm able to do already? By itself, not a lot, but where it becomes powerful is when you start to look at multiple environments. Let's first delete this and let's come out of this base directory and look at what we've got. We have an overlay directory. Inside of there, we have a production and a staging directory. Let's go look at staging. All right, we have a customization file in here. Ah, and this one's a lot more interesting. This one starts out and it says, okay, everything you create, give it a prefix of staging dash. 
give everything you create a label of environment staging. Head over to the base directory that we were just in and let's start with the files that are there. But then I want you to patch those files with the contents of these files in this directory. If I were to show you image.yaml, you'd see that, ah, okay, so the base is actually running 1.16, but the staging environment, we want it to run 1.17. And replicas, okay, we just want one replica. Well, what else? We have a different config map generator. Our original config map was this HTML file that simply says, hello from nowhere, hello class, this is the default environment. But the staging one says, hello from staging, this is the staging environment. If we head over to production, what do you think it says over there? Hello from production. And what's going on over here that's different? Okay, well, other than the labels, it still pulls from the same base, but now it's patching with some files that are in the production directory in addition to changing the config map. The production environment still runs Nginx 1.16 Alpine because we're a little bit more conservative with our images, but we run three replicas. So now, if I run kubectl apply-k staging, and then production, from that same base file, you'll see that we've created a staging deployment and a production deployment. And we have one staging pod and three production pods. And we could go in and we could look at the images and they'd be, they'd be different. And we have a staging config map and a production config map, which have the contents that you saw there. This is a way to take a base image and use it in multiple locations, only changing the portions of it that are relevant for the things that actually need to change. And this is extremely powerful for reducing the cognitive load and the number of places where you need to change content for it to be relevant. If you had three separate config files, three separate deployment files, three separate everythings for your development and your staging and your production environment, eventually somebody's going to forget to update something or update this instead of that. And a solution like Customize that's template-based, it'll save you a lot of headache. What are the config maps? Before I do that, let me go and look at what we got over here for questions. Oh, Deepak, Deepak's blowing up the questions. Uh, 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 oh, wow. Okay, well, your first four questions are covered in the documentation. So he asked, what's the best approach to install Rancher in production? That's in the documentation. Can we migrate Rancher from one Kubernetes cluster to another? You cannot. Uh, once Rancher is installed into Kubernetes, it's installed into Kubernetes, but what you can do is make a backup of that, and if the cluster melts down, you can restore that backup into a new, freshly built Kubernetes cluster. How to backup and restore the Rancher server, that's in the documentation. And how to restore the K3S from an external data store. K3S, for running in high availability mode, uses an external database, it could be Postgres or MySQL, so as long as you launch a new cluster and point it at the same data store, you have all of the same functionality. Danish says, what other strategy can we have other than rolling update for deployment? Well, you can tell it to stop, you can tell it to start pods and then stop pods. You can tell it to stop pods and then start pods. And you can tell it to kill everything and then start new ones. Those are your three options. Edward asks, what's the correct way to install Rancher in order to manage an AKS cluster? Uh, you'll get that answer when we get to the Rancher portion in a little bit. All right, that's it for questions for now. So let's jump over to config maps. We've been using the Nginx container as our example. You deploy Nginx, well, Nginx comes with its own config file. And I 100% guarantee you that the configuration file, the nginx.conf file that comes with the container is not the one that you need. 
it's going to have something that you need to change. So how do you solve this? Do you make your own container where you say from nginx and then you put your own config file in there? You could do that, but then you have to constantly update your container when their container changes or you have to, uh, I mean, it, it doesn't work. You have to remember to update, it's, it's more headache. You could mount a volume. So you could put your nginx.conf in like an NFS volume, and then you can attach that to your pods, and that would work. But now you have an additional dependency on an NFS layer. And if that goes down, then all sorts of bad stuff happens. So you want to try to avoid that if possible. Kubernetes solves this with config maps. You can override specific information inside of a container from a config map. And you can either have it, config maps are just key value pairs. Let me jump back over to here and we'll look at figmap we'll look at one of these guys oops i have to pass a dash oyaml all right this data key is what you are interested in and this has a key, in this case it happens to be called index.html, and it has a multi-line file. That's what that pipe symbol means there. It means that this is a multi-line value, oops, that I just totally tried to paste with my, uh, let's try that again. This is a multi-line value, which in our case just happens to be a bunch of HTML. But a config map can contain multiple key value pairs. Those can be assigned to the container as environment variables, where the key is the name of the variable and the value is the value. It can be individual files, which is how we're doing it here, where we're saying take, you know, make a file called this and make its contents that. Or you can even take a config map and have it control an entire directory where every single key becomes a file in that directory. What's cool about config maps one of the things that's cool about config maps is that they automatically are updated when they change without having to restart the container. If your application is smart enough to detect a configuration change and reload itself, then super. You can make changes to configurations on the fly and they can be automatically imported. An example of this is the Nginx ingress controller, which detects changes. Well, okay, so the Nginx ingress controller, we're not in ingresses yet, but it detects changes in the Kubernetes API and it reconfigures itself you can also change uh, like TCP services and UDP services that it listens on, and and it'll automatically make those changes when to its config when the when it detects the config map change. There's a a question about whether you should do that though, and and there's no right answer. One argument is that yeah, that's super because I can change things without restarting my container. If you're on the customize repeatable and declarative action side of things, you might say, well, that's not okay because now the state of the cluster, its current running state, is not reflected by what's in the repository. So customize by default will create config maps like you saw where, oops, ah, it'll create config maps like you saw where they have, uh, there we go, where they have these unique identifiers after them. And if we were to change the config map and update uh, update the whole deployment, it would recognize that the unique identifier had changed and it would update the deployment and then there would be a rolling update of the application. This is more intrusive because it does restart things, but at least then you know that the state of the cluster is directly reflected by the state of what's in the repo. Which one you choose is totally up to you. Either of them are fine. If you want to use customize, but you don't want that forced update behavior, you can tell customize to just replace the config maps in place. At this point, we have some pods and we have some config maps and nothing can talk to them. So that's not super useful. Services are the first step in exposing your application to things outside of the cluster. Pods have IP addresses, but you don't ever want to talk to them directly because you don't know that that pod will always be at that IP. It could get deleted and recreated somewhere else. Something else could get started with that IP. So you, you can't ever trust that a pod is going to be there or that that IP is correlated to it. Instead, you have a service 
which has a stable DNS name and a stable IP address, and it is responsible for keeping track of a group of pods using a selector. There are three types of services. Each one includes the types that came before it. Cluster IP is a service that only exists inside of the cluster. So you've got some web applications and they need to talk to memcache or something like that. Something that you don't need to talk to outside of the cluster. So you would have your memcache pods and you'd put a cluster IP service in front of them and then that's great. A node port service first creates a cluster IP service and then it opens a port on every node in the cluster. That port is a high port between 30,000 and 32767. Traffic that lands on that port is routed to the cluster IP service and is in turn routed to the pods behind it. Services aren't real things. They're, they're just a virtual logical thing that exists inside of IP tables. You would use a node port service if you have an external load balancer that you can't control from within the cluster. That'll make sense in a second. So if you have a Netscaler or an F5 big IP or something like that, you would put your uh, configuration there for your website or whatever your application is, and then you would populate the node pool with the nodes in Kubernetes cluster with the port from the node port, so you know the traffic lands on the load balancer, gets routed to the node port, and then gets routed to the service and routed to the pods. Fairly basic stuff. A load balancer service is when your cluster is in a cloud provider, it knows it's in a cloud provider, you've done all of the extra magical dance that you have to do to configure it to talk to the cloud provider, and then when you deploy a load balancer service, it first creates a cluster IP service, then a node port service, and then it reaches out over the cloud provider's API, and it creates a cloud provider load balancer. In the case of Amazon, this would be either an ELB or an NLB. It then configures that load balancer just as you would do manually with all of the hosts in the cluster where the node port is listening, and it maintains that configuration for the life of the service. So as nodes come and go, as the service changes, as any change that would affect the node pool on the load balancer is automatically updated in the load balancer. This is cool. And it looks like that. Services, like I said a minute ago, services aren't actually things. And they, they do some really cool stuff where, where they're handled by, by a Kubernetes component called kubeproxy that handles all of the routing and the communication for you. You can, with load balancer and node port services, add an additional declaration where perhaps, you know, if it comes in on node three, but there's no pods there, and it would ordinarily route it over to node one. Uh, if you don't want that extra step, you can tell it to only route to pods that are on the same host where the service might be listening. We already created services when we applied our stuff with Customize. So we have two services out there, Staging Nginx and Prod Nginx. These are both node port services. You can see they have an IP inside the cluster. And then over here, you can tell that they're node port services because they're mapping container port 80 to some high port over here. Remember the config maps that I created earlier? Well, that, that works, the staging one. And if we hit the production one, that works as well. If we look at these, They're pretty simple. I mean, there's, so we don't talk about annotations here, uh, but there's some default stuff. Notice here we have labels, app is Nginx and environment is staging. When we deployed these from customize, remember there was a common label of environment is staging. So everything from the staging customization.yaml file had that applied to it. And even though our base selector said, just look for things with the label of app is Nginx, customize modified that, knowing that everything also has the label of environment staging. And now all of our selectors look for things that have both labels, app is Nginx and environment is staging. And you can see that down here in the service definition. Otherwise, in the service spec, 
Cluster IP is, is set for us. That's just in the status. External traffic policy is cluster. And there's our node port. The node port is dynamically assigned, randomly assigned, although you can specify it if you want a specific node port, if you want to control that. There's our selector and then you know, various other things. So that's services. But you're, you're probably not going to create a load balancer service for every single one of your applications. Because if you have a cluster that has a thousand websites on it, you don't need a thousand ELBs, each of which is costing you $20 a month. There's a better way. And that way is what's called an ingress. A service is a layer four load balancer. It's what I call a dumb load balancer. And it's not dumb you know, in any negative sense, it just means that it doesn't make decisions. It receives traffic on a port and it sends it somewhere. It doesn't, it doesn't care. These are great for TCP type services and uh, in some cases UDP, though I personally never load balance UDP. But it's great for just routing things through. An ingress on the other hand is a layer seven load balancer and because it is an intelligent load balancer, it does make decisions, and these are used for HTTP style services. So layer seven load balancing, easiest example is a web application where it's going to look at the host header, the path, and then it's going to make a decision to route it to some cluster IP service inside of the cluster. Ingress, okay. I, I, early on in the class, I talked about ingress controllers. An ingress isn't really a thing. An ingress, remember, all we ever do is we, we change the desired state of the cluster. So the desired state of the cluster is we want the cluster to respond to requests for this host on this path and send it to this service. The ingress controller hears that request when we apply it to the cluster, and it changes its configuration file to serve that request. Ingress controllers are software-based load balancers. The most common one that you'll encounter is the Nginx load balancer. Though there's also HAProxy, there are API gateways, there's traffic, which is actually what we're using with K3S. There are lots of things that provide an ingress controller service, but all of them use the same ingress specification from Kubernetes. And they basically look like that. They're a thing that receives traffic, makes some decision, sends it to a service, and the service does what it's gonna do. They look like this. API version kind, metadata, and spec. Under metadata, you see the name, and then here we also have an annotation. In our particular case, the annotation is going to be ignored because we're not running Nginx. Annotations are a way for you to change small things about the Nginx or traffic or whatever the ingress controller is, small things in its configuration for this specific endpoint. The Nginx one that we have here does a thing. We could make a similar thing for traffic. The nice thing about annotations is that if we deploy this on traffic, it's just gonna ignore any annotation that's not for traffic. Down under rules, you see that we have a host, we have a path, we have a service name, and we have a service port. It's pretty simple. We could have multiple paths, we could send it to different services, we could have multiple hosts, we could send them to different places. But I have a customization file for this as well that's going to build this as part of our dev environment using just the raw base that we were originally working with. And the only change that we're going to make is to the service definition. Remember, the other two are node ports. This one we're going to create as a cluster IP service because we're also going to put an ingress there. When you have an ingress, you don't need a node port service because all of the communication from the ingress to the service is happening inside of the cluster. The node port will never be used. So this lets you turn all of your services into cluster IP services and then control the ingress to the cluster, literally not the ingress as the thing, but the, the entry into the cluster via the ingress and the ingress controller. We'll apply that with kubectl apply-k. You see they created a new config map, a new service, a new deployment, and an ingress. We look at our deployments, you see that we now have staging, prod, and dev. If we look at our pods, you'll see that we now have staging, prod, and dev. 
And if we look at our services, you'll see that we now have staging prod and dev, but notice that the dev service is a cluster IP service and there's no node port over here. But we do have an ingress. And now if I just run my curl directly against the host, I get that default config map that we saw earlier. So a quick recap. We launched a single node cluster. On that cluster, we deployed some pods. We deployed a deployment, which created a replica set and then some pods. We have multiple config maps, we have multiple services, and we have an ingress. And all in, we've created, in a single environment, three applications. all in about 40 minutes. And that's really all that there is to Kubernetes. Anything beyond this is specifically tailored for what it is that you want to do. I mean, and there's lots of stuff that you can do with Kubernetes. There's, like I said, there's storage, there's, you know, oh, the places that you can go. But all of it came from this. And, and you can think of it like you're building a car and you just bolt on, I guess you don't do this with cars, but you're building a thing and you bolt on the additional features that you need. And if you don't need them, you don't need to bolt them on. I find that it's best to learn things by learning the basics of it and then immersing myself in it. And as I reach obstacles that I have to overcome, I'm able to learn just whatever it is to overcome that specific obstacle. And over time, I end up with a much larger subset of knowledge that's directly attached to associations of other things. When you learn something and it's just a bunch of disparate data points, it's really hard for your brain to retain that information. But by associating it with real world experience or applications or problems or things that exist in your environment, you will retain the knowledge. The stuff that I've shown you today is stuff that you will use almost every single day as you're doing stuff with Kubernetes. So it's an excellent place to start. The next section is about Rancher. But I will jump over and see if we have any additional questions. We have a couple of questions here. I don't know the DNS name of a pod. You don't know the DNS name of a pod. You don't care about the pod other than whether or not it's running. What you do care about is the service sitting in front of it. Here we have three services that we care about. Dev Nginx, Prod Nginx, and Staging Nginx. And here you can actually see their IPs. But okay, I prefer DNS names over IPs as well. The service exists for pods in what's called a namespace. I'll talk about namespaces. I usually don't talk about namespaces until the rancher part, but it's relevant here. Namespaces are logical groups of resources within the Kubernetes cluster. By default, you have these three on a K3S cluster, though um, you're guaranteed to have default and kubedash system on every single Kubernetes cluster. Kubedash system is where Kubernetes system stuff runs. You should just leave it alone. And the default namespace by default is where your stuff goes. But you can create any other namespace that you want. And now you'll see that we have a namespace called Adrian. In a namespace, you cannot have two things of the same type with the same name. That makes sense, right? You can't have two deployments called Adrian or two deployments called Nginx, because how is Kubernetes going to know which one you're trying to talk to? The names have to be unique. One way to get around that is you have a deployment called Nginx prod and one called Nginx staging, which is what we've done here. And these are in the same namespace. Another strategy is that you have a namespace for staging and a namespace for production. And then you have a deployment called Nginx in each of them. Names only have to be unique within the namespace. Namespaces become the boundary for role-based access control within Kubernetes. So all of your security stuff of who is allowed to access what happens at the namespace layer. They're a great way to separate things between teams, separate things between people who shouldn't see what one another are working on. And you'll see some other stuff in the rancher part in a second. They're not required but they're relevant to the services question because
So let's wait for that to open up and then I will shell into that, which is another cool thing. And, and then I'll show you the DNS stuff. While we're waiting for that to load, let me look at this other question here from Deepak. Deepak says, what's the difference between Rancher and OpenShift? Hmm, what's the difference between BMW and Mercedes? Ask the guy who drives a BMW, you'll get one answer. Ask the guy who drives a Mercedes, you'll get another answer. Ask the guy who drives a Volvo, and you'll get yet a third. Rancher and OpenShift are two different products. They do similar things. They have a different approach. OpenShift is designed to build large clusters and gives tooling specific to developers for them to do stuff with Kubernetes. Rancher is designed for managing multiple clusters, hundreds or thousands of clusters from a single Rancher management interface and to do global level management of those multi-cluster functions. They have some things that they do that are similar and then they have a lot of things that they do that are different. Oh, the SAK container is taking forever to download. Let's try, uh, let's just fire up a busy box one instead. I probably have that in the cache. Oh man, <laughs> you can see I don't usually use the kubectl create command. Busy box. See, I'll create deploy busy box. Let's try that. No, oh, all right. We're not going to do this with this. Let's see if our other one is up and running. Otherwise, I will show you the answer to this. Yeah, so the SAK container is taking a while to download. It's my Swiss Army Knife container. It's like a super troubleshooting container. So once that's downloaded and running, I will answer your service question. But let's move on to the Rancher portion. I don't actually have any slides for the Rancher portion other than a slide that says it's Rager time. That slide there. There are two ways that you can install Rancher. Let's jump over to the browser. Here's the Rancher documentation. So this is rancher.com slash docs. Totally lost my mouse. There it is. So we'll come over here to the rancher2.x section and installing Rancher. You can install Rancher into a Kubernetes cluster. Now, everything that Rancher does is 100% free and open source. So everything that I'm doing today, you can do. There's no like open core. There's no, you pay us money, you get a different version of the product. It's all here for you and it's free. You can use it. We do have what's called an enterprise subscription, which includes support for Docker, Kubernetes, Rancher, all of the CNCF tooling that's built inside of it and a bunch of other things, but it's not required. For a supported Rancher configuration, the Kubernetes cluster into which it's installed needs to either be RKE or K3S, one of our two Kubernetes distributions. The reason for that is just because we control those distributions, so we can guarantee that Rancher is going to work there. If you installed it into AKS, for example, well, we don't control AKS, and maybe it works today, but tomorrow Microsoft might introduce some change to AKS that breaks Rancher. And since we don't control that, we can't support it. But, you know, if you're not paying for support, do whatever you're gonna do. The HA functionality of Rancher is delivered by the HA functionality of the Kubernetes cluster. So if you have a highly available Kubernetes cluster and you install Rancher into it, you get HA Rancher. If you have a single node Kubernetes cluster and you install Rancher into it, well, you get a single node Rancher. The other way that you can install Rancher, and this is also a non-production way, but it's fast and great for you know, demonstrations like this or lab environments or whatever, is to just install it using Docker. Then it just comes as a Docker container. And that's how we're going to do it today. My container ever finished loading? No. 
the disadvantage of living in South America is that everything is really far away. Let's jump over to our training server. Nope. I'll uh, explain this in a second. Sure that I have that version. Ah, 2.4.5. Good. That was a fun typo. All right. So Docker run dash D for detach or daemon or whichever, whichever one makes you feel more comfortable. Uh, restart is unless stopped. The reason for that one is because the upgrade process and the process for making backups of the standalone container version is that you stop the container and then you run your backup or you do your upgrade and then you, you know, if you did a backup, you start the container again. If you have restart equals always, then when you stop the container, Docker's going to restart it and you'll never be able to stop it. And so you'll have to just kill it. Then if you kill it, well, then you don't have anything to restart at the end of your backup. And uh, if you're doing an upgrade and the upgrade goes wrong, well, you don't have anything to roll back to. So just do unless stop. That way you can stop it and start it. We punch through ports 80 and 443. And then by default, it will create a Docker volume, but I prefer to bind mount a directory from the host. So I use opt rancher and I bind that to varlib rancher, which is the persistent directory location inside of the container. The reason for this for me is because if I want to make a backup or anything, I just stop the container, tar off that directory, and then start the container again. Doing this with a Docker volume is a little bit more complicated and requires some steps that I just don't like to do. And then the image that we're running is Rancher 2.4.5. And by now, that is probably up and running. And we will get an alert about self-signed certificates. This is the default. Rancher comes up with self-signed certs. You can also bring your own certs. You can bring, you know, whether they're real or self-signed. Uh, you can also tell it to generate a cert dynamically from Let's Encrypt, and it will do that for you as well. In my case, I will say, oh, it's dangerous. Yes, I accept the risk. Set the first time password. Agree to the terms and conditions. And now we have to set the Rancher server URL. It's important to get this right. When you deploy a downstream Kubernetes cluster, it's going to reach back into this address for its configuration. It'll open a WebSockets connection and it'll keep that connection open. This has to be reachable from the downstream Kubernetes clusters. You can use an IP here, but if that IP changes, it's the same as if the server URL had to change. It's a nightmare to change this because you end up with all your downstream clusters trying to connect to the wrong thing, and they don't know how to connect to the right thing to figure out that the address changed. It's like that time that your your ex moved and you went to the wrong house, and you're like, hmm, that's a terrible joke. Um, <laughs> I can make another joke about the time that I went to school and I came home and my parents had moved, but I, I don't remember what movie that was in. Set this to a server URL that is going to stay there. And now you're inside of Rancher. This is the default view where all of your Kubernetes clusters would appear. Say add cluster and you have a bunch of different options. We can deploy into a cloud provider. So we give Rancher our credentials and it will reach out to the cloud provider of the API according to the configuration that we set in all of the subsequent screens and it'll launch a hosted Kubernetes cluster and then wire that back, in, back into Rancher. We can also deploy cloud infrastructure. So in case of EC2, for example, same thing, give it the credentials, answer a bunch of questions about the instance types and the availability zones and the regions and all sorts of stuff. And then it will go out, launch the infrastructure, install Docker, install Rancher, and then wire it back into, well, sorry, install Docker, uh, deploy Kubernetes, and then wire that back into the Rancher server. Both of these options do full lifecycle management of the components. So if you delete a host from here within Rancher, it gets deleted out on the cloud provider. If you delete the cluster, it deletes the cluster. So you can manage everything from here. 
If you have a Kubernetes cluster running out there in the wild, you can import it. So any Kubernetes cluster that you've launched by any other means, you can just import into Rancher and Rancher can manage it for you. And if you do your host provisioning via anything else, Terraform, Puppet, Ansible, Chef, CloudInit, Shell Scripts, whatever, then you can simply install a supported version of Docker onto those hosts as part of your provisioning process and we'll give you a Docker run command that's unique to that cluster. Just put that at the end of your provisioner. And so now you just bring up the host, do all of your patching and updating or whatever you do, install all your templates and your configuration and whatever, whatever provisioning you do. Install Docker and then run this Docker run command and those hosts will join the cluster. This is a great way to do stuff with like auto scaling groups. If you have ASGs, uh, you can just put this Docker run command into the cloud config file. And then when you spin stuff up, it'll automatically join the cluster. Our K3S node, we're going to import. Rancher treats K3S a little bit differently than normal imported clusters. Once we import this, it will recognize that it's a K3S cluster and it will enable things like upgrades and, and other stuff special for K3S. Normally when you import a cluster, Rancher doesn't have access to any of the backend etcd or the, the Kubernetes bits itself. So it can't do anything more than manage workloads running inside of the cluster. Versus on an infrastructure layer, it can actually do upgrades of Kubernetes because it understands everything about Kubernetes running there and it has SSH access to the hosts itself. So there's a difference of whether it SSHs into the host and can see the entire Kubernetes cluster from the outside, or whether it connects via the Kubernetes API to the inside of the Kubernetes cluster, in which case it can only manage workloads running inside of the cluster. Because our Rancher server environment is using a self-signed certificate, I have to use this bottom option down here uh, because kubectl will not talk to an endpoint that's not using a real certificate. I'll jump over to the terminal, and we will run that. And it will create a whole bunch of objects for us. It'll take it a couple of minutes to install the agent and connect it back. And while it's doing that, let's talk about the stuff that's going on at the global level within Rancher. The first thing is this security tab. You can connect Rancher to, oh, and I'm not, Hang on. Browser. There we go. I didn't switch back off the slides. OK, so we're back over here. Uh, so that's installing. So yeah, so this authentication tab under the security. You can connect Rancher to any backend identity provider that you see here. This is huge. If you imagine that you're, you're in an organization, you're in the IT ops department, you know, you manage Kubernetes for a bunch of different teams and everybody wants to run Kubernetes where they want to run it. Somebody runs it in Amazon, somebody runs it in Google, somebody runs it on a server under their desk. You've got some running in your data center, you know, in the office, as well as in your data center out at Equinix. They're all over the place. Every single one of those clusters requires that you manage access credentials within every single one of those providers. So if somebody joins the organization, you got to go and make an Amazon account and a Google account and an under the desk account and an account over here. That's just more work for you. If somebody leaves the organization, you have to play this, this whack-a-mole security game of trying to figure out what did they have access to? And you got to go and look around and you make sure you delete it all. Otherwise you find yourself in a situation like Twitter yesterday, which is not actually related to an ex-employee. Although I guarantee you those employees are ex-employees now. With Rancher, you simply plug it into a backend identity provider and Rancher becomes an authentication proxy for every single cluster that it manages. So instead of using kubectl to connect directly to the clusters, as you'll see in a minute, Rancher generates a kubectl config file for your user account in Rancher. You then take those user accounts and you assign them to groups who have access to clusters. Somebody joins the organization, simply take their Active Directory account, put it in a group, that already has access to a cluster and they have access to it. When somebody leaves the organization, you disable their account in Active Directory and they immediately lose access to every cluster that they had access to. Much less work for you, much greater security for the organization. This is my favorite feature about what Rancher does. You can also put users and groups directly into Rancher if you don't have a backend identity provider. That's totally cool too. Here's where you would set the various roles for global, cluster, and project. 
it ships with a whole bunch of default roles. And if as soon as you get to looking at Kubernetes role-based access control directly, uh, you will see that that it's a bit of a nightmare. Whereas here we can come in and we can well, you can't configure the the default ones, but you can come in and add new roles that inherit from other roles. So you can get super, super, super granular with the roles that you assign to people and then you know that you assign to their clusters. Pod security policies also happen at the global level, and uh, we are moving towards oh, it's application policy engine. I don't remember the name of it now. There's a new thing that people are using, uh, which will be present in Rancher 2.5. Policy gateway. Yeah, I don't remember the name of it. The reason these things happen at the global level is because they have to happen above the clusters that Rancher is managing. On the deployment screen, you saw a bunch of different things, but that's not all that we support. So for example, there are alternative cluster drivers that you can just enable here. There are, there are alternative node drivers, uh, which you can also enable here. And all of these things are just Docker machine drivers. So if there's something that's not here, but there's a Docker machine driver for it, Proxmox or something like that, you can just add it over here. Or if you create one yourself, uh, you see that a lot of these are just open source ones that uh, that other people have made. You can let us know. We'll test it out. And if it's cool, you know, we're happy to include it. By now, our cluster is up. Yay! I talked to you about namespaces. Namespaces, I said, are the security boundary for role-based access control within the cluster. Take the scenario that I just described. Lots of clusters, lots of people, lots of nightmare. Apply that to a single cluster. What if you have a single cluster, lots of namespaces, lots of people? You still have lots of nightmare. If you have a dev team that needs access to 40 different namespaces for the applications that they support, but only in the dev environment and not in the production environment. Rancher solves this by collecting namespaces into projects and then applying role-based access control to the project. When it's applied to the project, it automatically propagates to all namespaces that are underneath it. When you first import a cluster, you get the default and system projects. Default contains the default namespace, system contains all the system namespaces. If you imported a cluster that has other namespaces, we may not know where to put them, so by Default, they go nowhere, but you can come up here, for example, the Adrian namespace, it doesn't know where to put that. So let's just take that and move that to the default project. And now the default project contains two namespaces. So that's what these are up here. Just like the system namespaces, you just kind of want to leave the system project alone unless you know what you're doing. Here in the default namespace, sorry, the default project, you can see we have all of the stuff that we ran, including the SAK container, which is now up and running. That allows me to answer the previous question by also demonstrating the things that you can do directly from within Rancher. Like we can just shell into that container. All right, so this has tools that I can use for troubleshooting. You guys can barely see that, I'm sorry. Let me actually switch over to the slides and I'll show you over there. Sorry, not the slides. Terminal. I'll show you over here. You just saw me shell into that container, and I can do the same thing from kubectl. kubectl exec dash it pass it the name of the pod and the process that you want to run inside. Yeah, the new kubectl has they changed the way that things work, so they prefer if I provide dash dash. And now. This is this is a super cool thing about kubectl. Like the cluster can be running anywhere, and over the the SSL encrypted connection between kubectl and the Kubernetes API, you can actually get direct access to pods running inside of the cluster, and that's just amazing. Uh, what's one of our services called? We have what staging dash nginx. Okay. The nginx. The staging Nginx deployment and pods are running in the default namespace. So the format for that is service name, namespace name, SVC, cluster.local. So the gentleman who asked, was it Bahrus, asked about the DNS name. 
that's what you would use. And now that will always be there. You know that that's always going to go to the staging nginx service inside of the default namespace, and svc.cluster.local is just the DNS FQDN and well, I guess domain subdomain for services. Uh, because of the way that DNS lookups work, you can actually just say staging nginx.default, and it's going to automatically look up in svc.cluster.local. You can see that here, where it has a search domain where it'll find all sorts of cool stuff. And if you're in fact in the same namespace, you could just go to staging nginx. So from this namespace, I can just go to staging nginx, but from the Adrian namespace, for example, I would have to go to staging nginx.default because it's in a different namespace. I only did that over there because it was a little bit easier for you to see Ah, huh. so let's let's delete these and then recreate them, and I'll show you some of the cool stuff that Rancher can do before we wrap this up. The Rancher portion of the training class is actually super simple um, because Rancher itself is really basic, um, but it's a good way to demonstrate the things that you've already seen me do and how we can do them so much more faster over here. Where am I? I'm still in that container. Delete dash K staging. So we'll delete our staging environment. We'll delete our production environment. And we will delete our ingress. And that just leaves us with the SAK container. So you can see that the changes that I make in kube control directly against the cluster are reflected inside of Rancher because they're both talking to the same Kubernetes API. Let's deploy something over here. We want a deployment of three pods, but I could run daemon set, stateful set, cron job, job. We're going to go with a deployment. We're going to do Monacus Rancher demo. And just for kicks, we'll put that in the Adrian namespace. I know that this container listens on port 8080, and I want to create a cluster IP service. And I'm going to add an environment variable of cow color equals yellow. Now, there's a whole lot of other stuff that I can do here that I haven't even really talked to you guys about. For example, I can set up a health check on port 8080, where if that fails, it'll restart the pod. We can attach volumes, whether they're from config maps or secrets, which are like config maps that hold secret data, certificates. We could even come back up here under environment variables. We can add environment variables from a source, like a config map or a secret. I talked to you about doing that. Down here on the bottom right, if I say show advanced options, well, there's a bunch more stuff that we can do in here related to like security and host config, or we can override the command. You can get, once again, super granular. But for most people, particularly people who are new to Kubernetes, this is just intuitive. You can come here and be like, oh yeah, here's the image, here's the port. You know, I understand the basic stuff about the services, so I'm just going to say launch. And this is going to go ahead and pull down the image and launch it for us. Up here under service discovery, you see that it created the service for us, so we don't have to do that. And if I come over to load balancing, say add an ingress, let's call this demo. We're going to put it in the Adrian namespace because it's going to those services and pods. And we will call this training-a.cl.monoc.us. We'll send it to a service, so we'll send slash to the demo service on port 8080, and we'll say save. That's up and running. Our workload is up and running. And if we go over here and we go to training-a.cl.monoc.us, well, then we get our cool demo. And this shows you the three replicas and the little green flag that's moving across them shows you which one is receiving the traffic. So you can see that the service just does round robin load balancing across them. I could go in and delete one and it would get recreated and I could show you all sorts of stuff with that. But let's just imagine that we built this app for a customer and we get into work tomorrow morning and the customer calls and he's like, we built that for a client and we had no idea that the client is allergic to the color yellow. 
what are we going to do? Well, Rancher's not hiding anything from you. You could come in here and you could say view edit YAML and you can get all of the YAML directly and you can make changes directly in here if you wanted to. Or you could come in and you could say edit and it takes you back to the same screen. You can just come over here and say, oh, okay, well, let's just change yellow to pink and you can say save. And now Rancher will instruct Kubernetes to do a rolling update of the application and in just a moment, you'll see the pink ones roll in. This is the tip of the iceberg for the types of things that Rancher can do. I was at KubeCon a year and a half ago, and somebody was asking me, like, what is the main benefit that Rancher provides? And I had this iPad in my hand, and I held it flat. And I said, you're, you're here. You're on one side of the iPad. And where you want to go is on the other side of the iPad. And the journey across is, you know, through the middle of the iPad. And that's learning Kubernetes. And it's, I mean, you'll get there, but it's got, like, rocks and goblins and werewolves and broken glass and danger and fire, and it's just... It's a struggle to get there. Rancher is a bridge that connects you from where you are now to where you want to be and makes the journey there pleasant. It makes it simple to do things with Kubernetes from the very beginning using no more knowledge than what I've given you in the first portion of today's class. But beyond doing stuff with Kubernetes, Rancher ships with additional tooling. Because once you have a Kubernetes cluster, there's this whole range of things that are called day two operations where you're like, well, now what? Well, how about alerting? We can send you alerts when there are problems with the cluster or problems with the workloads. How about logging? We can ship logs for the cluster or for individual projects to any one of these endpoints. Splunk, Elasticsearch, Kafka, Syslogs, FluentD. We can... Yeah, so there's monitoring is the other half of the alerting. What if you don't have a CI CD system and you want to start getting into doing automatic deployments of stuff? Well, great. We ship with a basic pipeline engine. So just point it at your repo and do some configuration. And now when you push changes to the repo, they'll automatically get deployed to the cluster. But what if, what if you're sitting at your desk and you're a developer? Because we get both developers and operators in this class. So you're a developer. And you start building an application and you're like, oh, I need to talk to a Hadoop cluster. But your team is using this Kubernetes thing. And you don't know how to deploy Hadoop in containers and you don't know how to deploy Hadoop in Kubernetes. And you don't really care because your job is not to figure out how to deploy Hadoop. Your job is to build an application that talks to Hadoop. There is a thing called Helm, which is the package manager for Kubernetes. Helm allows people to build configurations and ship them as a package where you could say Helm install Hadoop and you'll get a Hadoop cluster according to whatever configuration the package creator created. But that's that's probably not enough. You want to make changes to it. Well, with, with things that are in Helm, if you wanted to deploy them, oh, this is the wrong one. If you wanted to, Collapse. Do I, have, I don't have Helm stuff directly in here. Helm works with key value pairs where ordinarily you would have to know all of these things and be like, okay, image pull policy is this and volume permissions dot image dot repository is that. And this puts you back in the place where like, oh, what if you get this wrong? Like, why do I have to figure out what all these things are? I just, I, I just need an application that I can use. Rancher takes Helm and turns them into what are called Rancher apps. And now if you were to scroll down here inside of the Rancher apps, you find Hadoop. And once again, if you're somebody who doesn't know very much about Kubernetes, you still can probably figure out, do I wanna use the default image? Sure, do I want persistent storage? Uh, no, do I want replicas? Yes. You know, there's enough here in this form that is then converted into these config files using variable substitution. And you can come down here and I should close this preview. You can come down here and say launch. And in about seven minutes, you'll have a five node Hadoop cluster with replication already built in and up and running. And it hands you back an endpoint and you can just get back to building your app. And when everything is done, you can just come in and delete it if you so desire. 
That's the goal of Rancher. The goal of Rancher is to get you using Kubernetes, to get you benefiting from the value of Kubernetes, to get you leveraging the power of Kubernetes as quickly as possible and as safely as possible, while still just giving you the option to open the door or open the window and look behind the scenes and learn the the internals of Kubernetes on your own time when you need to know those things. We are at the end of our session, but we saw, oh my gosh, there's like a thousand questions. Okay, I'm gonna go through questions. If you have to leave, let me actually run the closing slides just in case you have to drop off, and then I'll come back and I'll answer the questions. And we'll stay until they're answered. If you want to know more about Rancher, I created the Rancher Academy, which is a certification course that teaches you everything you need to know about deploying Rancher in a standalone and HA environments and then using it to deploy and manage Kubernetes clusters. And it goes into way more depth on all of the stuff that you saw today on the Rancher side uh, and ends with a certificate that is valuable that you can use to show others both professionally and um, you know, you show your friends too if you want, uh, that you are blessed by Rancher in, in the knowledge to go forth and deploy and manage it in production. That's totally free. You can get it at academy.rancher.com. It is hugely popular. In our first week, we had, sorry, in our first day, we had over a thousand signups. It's been active for a little over a couple of months and we have close to 7,000 people enrolled right now. We've issued almost a thousand certificates. Remember that you can get support from the community on the Rancher user Slack. Go to slack.rancher.io if you don't have access to that yet. And in there, in addition to all the other channels, you'll find the Academy channel where it's, uh, it's for, people who are going through the academy. And there's also an office hours channel. I've recently started doing a, a monthly live stream in two sessions, one for the US and one for Europe, where it's just an open Q&A forum. So you can join the office hours channel, ask your questions there, and uh, myself and other Rancher engineers who join me will answer them live. This is me. Once again, you'll get a copy of these slides. I won't bore you with how to contact me, but if you want to, I'm available. I am the Director of Community and Evangelism for Rancher, so my job is to make sure that you are successful with Rancher and Kubernetes, and that's the sole reason for my existence in this company. All right, so if you have to drop, this is being recorded, it'll be posted on YouTube, and, uh, and you'll get a copy of the slides and a link to that within about 24 hours whenever I get the video edited and reposted. So let's jump back over to the questions. Sentil asks, can we restrict namespaces to certain nodes? Okay, that's that's a great question. No, but I know what you want to do there. Uh, what can I show you? Let's go back to the browser because that's a more interesting view. You cannot restrict a namespace to a node, but you can restrict what workloads run on a node. And you can either do that with a node selector, which is the old way to do it, or the new way to do it is with things called taints and tolerations. So if I come out here and I go to my node and I edit the node, you'll see that we have labels down here. So you can create what are called taints and tolerations. And a taint is a label on a, on a node and a toleration is a configuration on a workload that says that it can tolerate a certain taint. And you can use this to dynamically control where things get deployed. For example, you might have, um, you might have a, a set of worker nodes that have really fast SSD drives and you only want databases deployed there. So you can taint them so that nothing runs there and then you can create workloads that will tolerate that taint and they will be scheduled to that node or those nodes, or any node with that label. The taints and tolerations is better than node selectors because node selectors assume that that node is going to forever exist, and maybe it won't. Or maybe other nodes will exist that are also candidates for that workload. So taints and tolerations are a better way to go. Ah, Biswajit asks, can we run Windows application as a container using Rancher? Yes. Rancher supports, cancel this. Rancher supports Windows clusters. Back here, if we say add cluster, and if we go to custom, then notice we have Windows support here, and notice that it's grayed out. If we change the network provider to flannel, this becomes enabled. And now, if I were to say, let's call this Windows. 
if I were to say next, here's this docker run command that I told you about before. In order to run a Windows cluster, you first need a Linux control plane. So that's going to be etcd and control plane, and we'll turn off worker. And you'll launch that. If you want it to be HA, you need three of them. Once that's done, you can come to worker and, oh, that's interesting. Hang on a second here. I didn't enable Windows support. One moment, delete, let's get rid of that. Let's add cluster, custom, call this Windows again. We'll set this to flannel and we'll enable Windows support. All right, and then you can pick which flannel backend you want. And now when I say next, okay. Now you see we've got these options up here at the top for Linux and Windows. So first, make sure that Linux is selected over here and set up etcd and control plane. What you need is a Linux control plane and you need one Linux worker node that can run the ingress controller. That can also be one of your control plane nodes, that's up to you. But at the very least, you need to have Linux control plane and at least one Linux worker. Once all that's done, you can come over here to Windows and worker is the only option that's available and you can spin up as many Windows worker nodes as you want. Here's a PowerShell command that you paste into, uh, paste on those nodes, and they will fire up and join the cluster. Rancher treats Windows as a first-class citizen in Windows clusters. Most Kubernetes deployments that support Windows default to running workloads on Linux. So if you have a Windows, if you have a hybrid cluster that has some Linux workers and some Windows workers, and you just deploy something, it's gonna default to going to the Linux side. We figure that if you've gone through the trouble of deploying a Windows cluster, you probably want to run Windows workloads. So we default to actually the Windows side. You don't have to add a whole bunch of extra configuration to your deployment commands to run on Windows. You instead have to add that to run it on Linux. In our experience, most people who are running Windows clusters are not running hybrid clusters. They're running dedicated Windows clusters. And so you know, we want to make your job as easy as possible. Andre asks, what is Rancher OS? Rancher OS is an operating system that was created by Rancher. It's a container-based operating system, and it ran everything as Docker containers. All system services were Docker containers, <clears throat> and, uh, and then there was a separate user space Docker that ran all of the workloads. It's still out there. We still have customers that use it, and it's still uh, supported for those customers, but it only gets maintenance updates, because when it came out, there was only Docker. And, and now there's Cryo and Containerd and a whole bunch of other stuff. So it doesn't make sense to have a Docker-based operating system. We are now building K3 OS, which is an operating system that's basically the kernel plus K3S and allows you to manage all of the operating system components from within Kubernetes. So you can actually do kernel upgrades and package updates and things like that on the host from within Kubernetes. It's pretty cool. So if you're looking for a container-based operating system, I don't recommend that you run Rancher OS right now because you're going to paint yourself into a corner. Uh, I also don't recommend that you run K3 OS yet, but keep your eye on it because it is being actively developed and it's super cool. Deepak asks, what's the difference between K3S and RKE and which one should we use for production? You can use either of them for production. The difference is that RKE is the entire upstream Kubernetes and it's just repackaged as Docker containers to make it easier to deploy. K3S is super lightweight. Inside of Kubernetes are drivers and configuration for basically everything. So if you're running Kubernetes in Amazon, you still have all of the driver configuration for GKE and Azure and a bunch of other stuff that you're just never going to use. K3S stripped all of that default stuff out and makes it eligible for you to put it back in if you need it. So if you're deploying K3S into Amazon, you, it's, it's called in-tree versus out-of-tree. You can deploy out-of-tree configuration that allows you to do EBS volumes and things like that. They're both production grade. Because K3S is lightweight, it comes up really fast and it behaves really fast. It's just a super fast, super fast version of, of Kubernetes. RKE is also 
totally fine as well. If you are deploying stuff in a cloud provider or in a place that's not resource constrained, you might find that it's just less work to deploy RKE. And anything that is less work for you, I'm totally a fan of. Uh, if you want stuff in a home environment, if you have a lab environment, if you want to build a Kubernetes cluster on a Raspberry Pi, if you're doing stuff in edge environments, then K3S is designed for that. I mean, we have people running K3S on, on fighter jets. We have K3S in wind farms. We have K3S, we have K3S running in a bunch of really cool places, uh, primarily edge type deployments. They're both GA, they're both production, and they're both supported. Deepak also asks if we can change the Rancher URL after configuration. It's theoretically possible, but it is an absolute nightmare to do it. I recommend that if you can get it right the first time, you should and try not to change it. And that's why you use a DNS name. Use a DNS name. So if you need to move the servers to a different IP, well, then you just repoint the DNS and all the downstream clusters are fine. Baru says, so if I have two master nodes and four worker nodes in K3S cluster, should I install Rancher in each master node? What is the best practice? No, you install Rancher into the cluster. Um, what we did today was we, we fired up the Docker container. You wouldn't do that if you're running it on a Kubernetes cluster. You would follow the instructions in the documentation to install it into a Kubernetes cluster. That was really, that was a horrible highlighting job. So installing Rancher into a Kubernetes cluster. The default here uh, talks about how to spin up K3S, but this installs Rancher via Helm and you can install it into Kubernetes and then it's just running inside of Kubernetes. Edward asked why I set a different domain at the start configuration of Rancher. When it came up, uh, let's see, Rancher. All right, so when it came up, my, my URL up here that you can probably barely see because it's so small, I just went to training-s because it's, it's local to my my machine that I'm on here, so it's just less to type. The initial server URL is taken by JavaScript from the location bar. So had I gone to the full FQDN, which my home is um, that's what it would have put in there. Because it put training-s, I just use the fully qualified domain name um, as a habit, because that's, if, if you're telling something else the address of another thing, it's good to give it the FQDN. It's just, it's just good. Like if you, if you're giving somebody your, your home address, you know, even if they live in the same town as you, um, I don't know, maybe the, the example breaks down there because if they move, they, they at least remember the town that they came from. But if you have a, a Kubernetes cluster that's just configured in your office to, to talk to, uh, you know, rancher without an internal domain name, and then you, you know, make a backup of that cluster and you restore it somebody someplace else that's not in your office, it's still going to be trying to talk to just Rancher. Whereas if even if it's in your office, if you give it the FQDN and then you move it somewhere else, well, the FQDN still applies. So from a best practices, from a configuration management perspective, the FQDN is better. I'm just lazy because I'm typing stuff in the browser and I don't want that laziness to carry over to my clusters. Lots of questions. Ooh, and the questions keep rolling in. Okay, we're we're in it. Can you run Rancher on the same host server as K3S? Yes, you install Rancher into the K3S cluster. Do not run the Docker version on the same host where you're running Kubernetes. Uh, do not try to import a Kubernetes cluster into a Rancher environment that's running on the same cluster. And that's no. Deploy Kubernetes, install Rancher into it, or if you're just playing around have a host that's running Rancher as a Docker container and another host that's running the Kubernetes cluster. Honestly, K3S is so easy. You can just install a K3S cluster on a single node. It takes like a minute to come up and then install Rancher via Helm. The only reason I don't do that in the class is because it takes about 10 minutes to do all of the stuff and pull down the packages and configure Helm and things like that. And I don't wanna waste that time in the class. Uh, Demon, you're asking me a specific Rancher CLI question that I don't know how to answer. Uh, so that's a good question to take to the Rancher user Slack and ask people over there.
Bonnie was asking about monitoring and alerts in Rancher. Uh, we don't go into that in this class, but the Rancher Academy has a whole section on how to do all of that configuration, monitoring and alerting for cluster and workloads, as well as uh, the log shipping that you asked for for Splunk. Chris asks if K3S is ideal for HA production setups as well as single node development setups, or if it's better to use RKE for high availability. You can go either way. They approach it differently. RKE is traditional Kubernetes in that it runs etcd, and if you have three etcd nodes, then you have an HA cluster, or any odd number greater than one. So three, five, seven, 253, whatever, it's HA. K3S does not use an embedded etcd. They're, they're working towards embedded etcd, but its HA functionality is actually handled by something external. The reason for that is we want to keep K3S small and fast. So for an HA K3S deployment, you actually have to have an external HA database of some kind, MySQL, MariahDB, Postgres, Percona, whatever. You can also use an external etcd cluster, but then you need three nodes instead of two. That's the HA component of it. So if you have an HA database, K3S is HA, and that's great. That's totally great for production. If you don't want to manage an external data source and you want it all within Kubernetes, then RKE. And RKE with three nodes, then you get HA, etcd, and you're good to go. Danush, you're also asking VMware questions. Uh, we do have, I think, an actual dedicated channel to VMware on the Rancher user Slack, but otherwise join over there and people can help you out. We have a lot of people running vSphere, running stuff in vSphere, including a bunch of people running Rancher OS. So you can get help over there. Ah, Kevin says, thank you. You're welcome, Kevin. Naveen asks, what's the difference between Sivo and Rancher? Sivo is a company in, I think, the UK that you can get K3S clusters from. So they're like a cloud provider for K3S. Rancher is the whole application that I've been showing you today. So it's, unless you mean what's the difference between Sivo the company and Rancher the company, in which case Sivo the company runs K3S, which was created by Rancher. But because it's open source, they can do that. And we think that's great. Uh, we, we know them. Uh, they are friends of ours, and we absolutely support what they do. Edward asks if you need an AKS cluster to install Rancher in order to manage multiple AKS clusters. No, this is also a great question. On this global cluster screen here, let me delete this Windows cluster that's never going to go anywhere. You can, so a single Rancher server installation can manage hundreds or thousands, depending on the size of the cluster, of Kubernetes systems running anywhere. As long as they can reach the Rancher server, they can be anywhere. They can be in AWS, they can be in your house, they can be in your office, they can be in Azure, they can be all over the place. And you can bring them all into Rancher, you can deploy them all from Rancher, and, and you're good to go. The thing to consider is network latency. If you have a Rancher server cluster in the United States, and it's managing a cluster in Australia, then there's there's, you know, the, the speed of light is a constant. So we can't control that latency. And it's best to try to position Rancher server clusters relatively close to the things that they're managing. So relatively close would be like within the continental United States. If you have uh, infrastructure in the East Coast and infrastructure in the West Coast, then put your Rancher server cluster in the Midwest. Um, that way it's it gets the best for both sides. But I would personally not manage a European Kubernetes cluster from a US Rancher server cluster. I would instead deploy a Rancher server cluster in Europe and have it manage that, those resources. You are welcome, Nitin. Ah, yeah, Andre says that he's excited about K3OS. I've seen what they can do with the plans and the kernel upgrades. In fact, if you go back through the Google, or not the Google, the, the YouTube channel, uh, you will find a meetup that we did a few months ago where they actually showed how to do immutable type infrastructure and host upgrades from within uh, K3OS. It, it's, it's amazing. 
can you deploy Rancher apps from repos or only by the GUI? There is, so this is a question from Claudio. All right, down here in the bottom right corner, you can see that we have download CLI. This is the Rancher CLI, which includes all of the kubectl functionality, but also includes, oh, I totally didn't show you guys something. It also includes stuff for managing Rancher specific things. So you can deploy Rancher apps with the Rancher CLI. Um, and that would include anything that's in the app catalog over here. So that would include anything from Helm or from all of the Rancher apps. If you want to add catalogs, uh, you can do it at the global level. So if you have a specific Helm repo that you need to add, you can just click add catalog up here in the top right and you can set it up. And then you can also define the scope. So you can, you can put things at the global level, they're visible to all clusters. You can put it at the cluster level, it's visible to all projects in that cluster. And you can also put catalogs at the project level and it's only visible to that project. But what I did not show you is here at the main cluster screen, we have these two buttons up here in the top right. First, we can just launch a local kubectl shell. So if there's one-off kubectl commands that you want to run, you can just run them here. But I told you that Rancher is an authentication proxy. So there's this kubeconfig file button. And this gives you a kubeconfig file that proxies everything through Rancher. You can actually see here in the server URL that it's going through the Rancher server. This is what you would have users use once you bind Rancher to your backend identity provider. They wouldn't connect to clusters directly. Banu asks about storage classes and persistent volumes. We don't cover those in this class uh, just because there's not enough time. Okay, so that is it for the questions. Um, thank you so much, all of you who stayed and all of you who asked questions. Questions are the most important part of this because it allows me to answer the things that are most important to you so that you can get the most out of this training. So we will wrap it up. I have a couple more, whoops. I have a couple more slides. Let me make sure I didn't just mute myself. No, all right, still there. Rancher Academy, I already showed you that. That is free and, and you'll get a lot out of it. Uh, there's also the Rancher YouTube channel. This has well, it has classes like this, which actually go up uh, unlisted. Um, there's previous trainings up there. There's meetups. There's master classes. There's office hours stuff. There's it, It's all educational content from the various online things that we ourselves do. And we do stuff every single week. And then I also have a YouTube channel, which I update intermittently because I spend a lot of time making content for Rancher. But this is... This is like real hands-on stuff about how to do stuff with Rancher, how to do stuff with Kubernetes, how to do stuff with various other things. I, I live in the middle of nowhere in central Chile, and I have an extensive infrastructure here that I use for home automation and energy control. So I make content for this. And in fact, next week, I'll be starting a new daily live stream called Coffee and Cloud Native, where I'll be discussing interesting things that happened in the cloud native landscape in the previous day. And I've... I've decided to uh, to do that at 7.30 in the morning every single day <laughs> uh, as I drink my morning coffee. So you'll find that uh, on my YouTube channel, which you can get uh, at adrian.coins.tv or the URL that you see down below. So that's it. Thank you all so much. Uh, you can find me in the Rancher Users Slack. I'm Adrian. Uh, I hope you join the Academy. And I hope that someday I get to see you at an in-person event, KubeCon or DockerCon or reinvent or something. Um, but until then, you know, keep on learning. This is your future. Have a great day.